Good evening, everyone. Hello. Thank you for coming out on such a beautiful day and evening to be with us. Um, it's, uh, it's always fun to talk about art, and in particular, buying art. I think that's why we're all here. Uh, this panel is, as you know, about collecting. And before we go on, I just would like to introduce our panelists. Thank you all, all four of you, for being with us uh, on a busy day, busy week. Um, I'm going to read the biographies in order of, uh, if from your vantage point, left to right. And I just want you to know the context of who these folks are. That's why I'm doing it. Also because they have fascinating lives. First up, Shelley Farmer. Uh, she is the director of Herschel and Adler Modern in New York, referred to as the contemporary arm of Herschel and Adler Galleries. That's on Fifth Avenue in the Crown Building. The modern unit focuses on art made from 1913 through today, mostly by Americans. This is Shelley's 17th year with the gallery. Apparently she was a little girl when she began. Yeah. Which is kind of cool. uh, before that, she had earned her BA in art history and American studies from Vassar College, followed by postgraduate certificates from Southern Institute at NYU's appraisal studies program. One of Shelley's mandates has been to build a contemporary program that makes sense on its own while also complementing the gallery's renowned holdings in 18th through 20th century art. If you don't know Virgil Nadler, I do hope you'll go soon. There's a fabulous show on now of David McGuire's paintings that complements the neoclassical works of art nearby. Um, the, the, the gallery, modern in particular, uh, presents about six to 10 solo and group exhibitions each year by both established and emerging artists. Because her department is expected not only to source art, but also to sell it, it participates in four to five major art fairs each year. And those include Art Basel at Miami Beach, the Armory Show, the ADAA Art Show, Masterpiece London, and Art Hamptons. And we are going to talk about fairs tonight, among other topics. Shelley's personal areas of interest extend to American and European modernism and post-war art, photography, and outsider art. Welcome, Shelley. Next over, Jack Esterson. Jack is a design partner at Think, exclamation point, architecture and design. That's based here in New York. Uh, he has been practicing architecture uh, in New York for 40 years, uh, 25 of those years in independent practice. Again, started in boyhood, obviously. I can't quite believe what I'm reading here, but OK, that's cool. His early. <laughs> Very early. His principal interest lies at the intersection of visual artistry and its potential benefits when applied to New York's communities and underserved populations. Since the mid-1990s, Jack and his husband, Richard Monteleone, who's here tonight, uh, have been restoring a 19th century Brooklyn brownstone and filling it with the work of New York artists. Uh, Jack also serves on the board of the Brooklyn Arts Council. Thank you, Jack, for being here. Next to Jack is Megan McCarthy. Megan serves as Major Gifts Officer at the Museum of Modern Art here in New York. This past February, she received her PhD from Columbia University with a dissertation entitled The Empire on Display, Exhibitions of Germanic Art and Design in America, 1890-1914. Very unusual topic. Previously, <laughs> uh, previously, Megan held positions in curatorial development and education departments at the Met, at the Whitney, and the Peggy Guggenheim Collection in Venice. She earned her MA at London's Courtauld Institute of Art and her BA at Columbia, uh, both with theses exploring the work of late 19th century Viennese artists. Welcome. And finally, but not, not finally at all, Tim Newton. Uh, Tim Newton is well known to many of you. Uh, he's been collecting art for 25 years, and he now owns some 300 works. Uh, already featured uh, in several magazine articles, like Fun Art for the Sir. Uh, this is a collection of great diversity that includes pieces by such stars as Richard Schmidt, John Stobart, Sherry McGraw, Donald Demers, Christopher Blossom, Clyde Askelvig, Bill Achef, Lanford Monroe, Kurt Walters, Tim Schoenbarger, and Frank Crow. Tim is the founder and curator of American Masters, an annual art exhibition and sale which is held here at the Zamagundi Club. Since its launch in 2008, the show has uh, exhibited some of the very best in American contemporary art. It's run entirely by volunteers, including Tim, and with all the proceeds being dedicated to this recently renovated gallery in which we're sitting tonight. So congratulations on that success, which goes on. Um, Tim has judged a wide range of art competitions, including Connecticut's Mystic International Maritime Exhibition and Maryland's Plein Air Easter. 
He is beginning his third term as chairman of the board here at the South Bend Club, and he also serves on the boards of the Artist Fellowship, the Stobart Foundation, and the Clark Hewlings Foundation. So, thank you for hosting us. Thank you. So, I want to say thank you as well to Andy and Pat for organizing tonight's event. Um, I feel that um, this is a talented bunch, and we're grateful for your time. Uh, but I also want to play a little bit of hardball. I want to ask some questions. Um, I'll begin, however, with collectors at the center of the dialogue. Very quickly, I would love it if Jack and Tim could each describe very briefly what they got at home in the way of art. What is the kind of art they love? Uh, because I think we never want to lose sight of the individual passions that bring us all together here as collectors. Jack, can you just tell us something about your work? Yeah, um, we live on two floors of a brownstone, and we used to own a country house full of, filled with antique furniture, and we sold the house, and our brownstone on one floor has antique furniture, and on the parlor floor, which is where we entertain, has really modern furniture. So somehow our collection bifurcated into very contemporary art on the parlor floor, which is very public. And then figurative are um, on the ground floor. We, we also have probably several hundred, I, I don't even know how many <laughs> pieces we have. It's so crazy. But um, uh, I think if there's one sort of common thread to the work that Richard and I collect, it, it would be, I guess one word would just be exuberance. It's, it's extremely dynamic, polychromatic, active art, um, complex, layered, whether it's figurative or contemporary, um, that seems to be a kind of unconscious thread. We never really thought about it. But that, you know, when you collect and then you look back and see what you've got, there is a common thread often, and, and I think that would best describe what we have. Exuberance. I love Exuberance. That word. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Tim. I think probably a simple description of the type of art that my wife and I collect would be the art that you see in the room around tonight. Very traditional, uh, uh, very diverse. Uh, started you know, many years ago really with landscape and uh, now components of still life and figurative and uh, an emphasis that Peter would know and would say an emphasis that on nocturnes and snow scenes yeah. and even best snow at night. It's you know, <laughs> the, <laughs> the perfect storm on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> Along the way, uh, have had a real um, uh, love and interest in coastal maritime nautical scenes that that evolved uh, rather uh, unconsciously, I think, but. I've, I've made great friendships with a couple of the very best of American maritime painters, and that led me down that path further. And so maybe some 40 or 50 coastal maritime, they're, they're not all ships at sea, but that, that type of thing, and have a uh, the strength there for sure. So that's interesting. You mentioned something about I've gotten to know some of these artists, and I'd like to ask both Tim and Jack about friendships with the artists, or at least acquaintances. Uh, how does that work? How important is that to you, Jack, to, to know the artist himself or herself? It's a really good question, and it's incredibly important. Um, in fact, I would say, I don't know, Rich, help me out here, probably 70 or 80 percent of the work that we own, we bought from friends. Yep. And sometimes we bought from people we didn't know that became friends because we just kept buying and going to their houses and their studios and developing relationships with them, right. or vice versa. Okay. They were friends that we've known for years that we just loved their work right. and kept buying it. Um, and uh, so, and then they, those people would have friends who were artists and the genealogy kept growing <laughs> out of control. Um, so friendship and relationships is, for me, completely essential because we, we take a very non-professional, I mean, of all the panelists, I'm the non-art professional here, right? So I, we just buy out of instinct and relationship and friendship and, um, you know, just sort of what we love. Um, and it's very, very connected to, to, to friendship. Really. Yeah. 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 All of my friends really now are artists. I, I'm not a professional, although I'm involved here as well. 
Collins here as chairman, but um, you know, all of my friends are artists or art related, and certainly it makes a difference. So you you're more knowledgeable and aware of what they're doing and their particular proficiency, and and sometimes out of that comes opportunity yep. that you are at the right place at the right time. And Shelley, I'd like to ask you a question about another side of this issue, which would be, how does an art dealer generate these friendships? That, that obviously you're in the middle of the artist as a collector. Mm -hmm. uh, the collector may come through the gallery, not know a thing about the artist, mm -hmm. loves what they see, asks you questions. Um, you may try to introduce them at the opening party, etc. But um, how does that roll out over time? I mean, I would imagine from where I'm sitting that a dealer might be a little anxious about a direct friendship whereby the transaction goes through without the dealer being involved. On the other hand, it seems to me that you're dealing with very high caliber artists and collectors who know better than to do that, which is really as it should be, in my opinion. Any thoughts on this? Um, that is a great question. I think that a place like Herschel Nadler, as you mentioned, the artists who are in our program are very professional and they wouldn't go behind our backs, I think, and sell out of their studio because um, they, need, they need our services. Uh, we provide a lot to them and they, and they give back to us. But in terms of meeting, collectors meeting the artists, some collectors don't want to know the artists. I'm really? Say, yeah, because okay. some really do, and sure. in that instance often will um, be the middleman between commissions and artists yep. and sure. a, a patron, a client who wants to specific piece or a bigger piece or one of the uh, exhibitions has been sold. But then there are other people who just really want to look at the art mm -hmm. without talking to the artist okay. so much. I mean, I just want to say, in some sure. cases, these are people who may, yeah. Megan uh, will know about this, who like to go to museums and never read a museum label uh -huh. during an exhibition and just say, that's too much stuff. I right. just want to look at the art. I don't want to be told what to look for <coughs> in the art or I don't want the artist telling me I was thinking about my mother when I wrote the right. or whatever. So I think it's um, I think it's very personal, and I think. Um, but if for us, if a client wants to meet the artist, we'll do everything. We do studio visits. Sure. Once they start collecting, we go to lunch. I mean, we really we are kind of matchmakers yep. in that way. Yep. But I think there's a professional boundary that needs to be respected yes. between what the collector can be asking of the artist mm -hmm. as well. You know, they go yes. to the studio and say, can't you, can you put one more boat in there? Right. <laughs> yeah, I only got a little more cake, you know, the artist yeah. pulled me aside out his journal. So I think it's I think it's a personal decision and we, we help yeah. we help either way. I want to make sure we come back to commissions. It's a yeah. really interesting area, but I think every one of you will have a thought on it. So let's hold that. I want to come to Megan for a minute though. Um, in your role at BOMA in development. Um, I'm especially interested in museum friends committees or councils, the idea that uh, each department potentially has its own support group of individual collectors. Can you tell us more about how MoMA does it uh, and how that might bring about friendships between individuals and collectors? I think um, a, a big portion of, I work in, I work in major giving and I work in one of, uh, one of our most generous patient groups that contribute to our uh, general operating support. Um, and Part of what um, I guess we offer to them is a chance to meet like-minded um, individuals who are as invested in the activities of MoMA as they are in meeting other people who are not only um, inspired um, and inspiring to us, but also um, also collectors as well. And so, for example, a lot of our patrons, you know, in terms of matchmaking, you mentioned this earlier. Um, Several of our patients are happy to, you know, contribute to our bottom line, but others are, say, most interested in photography or most interested in drawing from prints. And so each of our curatorial uh, departments does have what we call an affiliate committee, mm -hmm. yes. where um, I don't know precisely how it works, but their contributions to the museum go to acquisitions for that department because they are particularly invested in the curatorial staff or in kind of learning and wanting to know and be involved in the activities uh, that MoMA is doing in, you know, media performance or something right. like that. So, I mean, I would encourage, um, and I see kind of collecting and direct philanthropy going hand in hand in a lot of ways, um, but I would encourage if anyone has a particular kind of interest in specifically media or period, that a lot of these organizations and arts institutions in the city, not just MoMA, right. 
has different kinds of groups of, of patrons and supporters at various levels where you can meet like-minded individuals but also kind of um, hear more about going on at the institutional level as well as the private level by engaging in such relations. So when I was at the Brooklyn Museum, yeah. we would sometimes have those committees go and visit studios yes. or galleries or other private collectors' homes. So I think there is that element of inspiration that goes Precisely. on. Precisely, and that is, that's fairly typical. That yeah. moment that okay. well. Good. Various affiliate groups, but also our patron committees. Well. Great. No, yeah. I think that's something to keep an eye on because it is a very inexpensive, relatively, way uh, to educate the eye. Yeah. Uh, because after all, it's a tax deductible gift, uh, and you get to have all this expert uh, input uh, as you move through your collecting journey. Yeah. Good. Um, I would like to <coughs> ask uh, a question of the whole group uh, to do with how we now experience art that is new to us. Um, I'd love each of you to weigh in on some theme uh, that is um, very present for you, and I'll give you an example. Uh, I hear a lot of people now say, I never go to galleries, I only go to fairs. That that's where I go to see art I don't know, or maybe art I already do. Um, that's fine, I mean, it is what it is. But how does that fair experience differ or resemble the visit to the gallery, or even to the artist studio? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, because this is where we get our feet wet potentially, mm -hmm. in the work of a new artist. A, an artist who is new to us, let me be clear. It could be an artist who's 80 years old, but we just don't happen to know them. Uh, Jack, I, I love it. Yeah, because I just went to my first art fair last week. Oh, OK. <laughs> freeze. <coughs> wow. Um, Randall's so Island. Yes, yeah. you did survive. <laughs> I was a survivor. <laughs> so I just thought, you know, why not? I'd never been to one. And okay. it was enormous. There are Hundreds and it's, it's completely overwhelming. I tried to do it in a day, um, and I wasn't shopping for art. I just wanted to experience the art fair phenomenon. Okay, I've never been to Art Basel or Miami or anything, um, and I loved it. It was very entertaining, okay. and it was marvelous. I saw a ton of great art, okay. none of which I could afford. Um, really, and also yeah. none of the price tags were on anything, so you had to kind of engage right. because it's not a, you know it's not like that at all. Right. Um, I definitely felt outclassed. Oh. Um, although I'm educated, I'm an, I'm an educated art viewer, so I, I, I got the art, um, and I loved a lot of it, and I, it was a really exciting experience. Good. And I think part of it was because I wasn't there to shop. Right. I was just there to absorb the phenomenon of seeing this group of people. It is a phenomenon. It's definitely. And, and, and the tent itself is quite amazing. Yes. I mean, it's, it's really it's, remarkable yeah. piece of architecture. Yeah. But can you compare that to going to a gallery? You know, when you go with Richard to a gallery, is that in Chelsea? Is that in Brooklyn? Is it kind of anywhere that you might have? It's, it's in Brooklyn. Okay. We live okay. there, and our base is there. And sure. we, tend to, we tend to go to galleries more in Brooklyn. Than okay. But we'll, I'll spend a weekend in Chelsea. You know? Sure. Not so often. But you know, when you do that, I tend to be more targeted. You know, I go because I know the artist. I want to see that work, or a friend told me to. Okay. You go to freeze, and you're seeing hundreds right. of different. I mean, it's just a completely immersive experience. So, okay. I mean, for that for that reason, it's utterly different. But now, when you're in a gallery zone, like Chelsea yeah. or, or a certain part of Brooklyn, yeah. do you spill over into galleries that you aren't necessarily? aware of the artist on view? In other words, sure. is there a kind of accidental sure. aspect yes. to your visit? Yes, of course. If okay. I see something in the window, or yeah, then, yeah absolutely. I'll, and I'll I'm go. curious about how does that feel over time, since you've been collecting for a while? Um, are you seeing people of all ages doing that gallery hop? Or is the audience gray? Or what? what? What are your thoughts on that part of the art mm -hmm. scene? I don't know, Peter. I, I, I think it's the same. I see a lot of generators. Yeah. All generations okay. go. Good. Personal. Okay. Yeah. Shall we have thoughts on any of this? I mean, I think, this is a I fair think, person I think here. I think that's so. a, a great question because we, at Herschel Nadler, we do, uh, we not solo exhibitions by artists. We put together group exhibitions. My colleague and I put together exhibitions where we are melding the contemporary artists who we have with historical mm -hmm. artists who we have and uh, trying to uh, make connections between them, and coming up with interesting shows to bring people in. And at the gallery, we tend to have all different types of art on view. So we'll have neoclassical furniture, you can look at candlesticks, and you can look at uh, an Andy Warhol drawing. And in my office, I had a Calder mobile over my desk for a while, which was great. 
Um, but I think with art fairs, they're so overwhelming, and I know a lot of people just say, I can't do the art fairs, so just forget, you know, wear comfortable shoes, have a coffee every you know, two hours or something. But I think, I think when you go to art fairs, what I always ask myself with the dealer, what am I not seeing in this booth? Because often what you don't know as collectors is as a, as a dealer, we're often told what we can and cannot bring to certain fairs. So Art Basel and Beach, for example, for us, we, we aren't Pace, we aren't Bogosian, we don't deal in the really contemporary blue chip names. We're asked to bring American modernism. So we bring Hopper, uh, O'Keefe, Marin, you know, that type of genre. So if you walk up to me and you're asking me about the art I have in the booth there, I, I still have a lot of contemporary art at the gallery I can talk to you about. So that brand of gallery that you're seeing in that moment isn't necessarily all that they're about. So, and mostly when we're at the fairs, we, I want to talk to people. I mean, you can ask me any question. I want to answer questions. I'm there to talk about the art, talk about the artists. I think it'd be very, it can be very intimidating at these art fairs and, you know, I can't stand it. We put prices on our labels often. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't because, you know, just, it's okay. It starts a dialogue, but also some of these galleries don't even put the name of the artist on it, and that's annoying. It's like, if you don't know the artist, then you, you don't belong here. I, I, I can't stand that. I'm really annoying. So, I just want to say, like, we, you know, we participate. There's, there's different agendas. There's different agendas for an art show or an art fair, and there's different agendas for a museum exhibition. There's a different agenda for the gallery show, and I think um, you need to sort of you know, if it's a really contemporary fair, all you're really going to see that is contemporary art, but that dealer may also have uh, historic paintings as well. So go up and talk to a dealer who looks friendly and start asking questions, and you never know, you may end up buying something down the road that wasn't even represented in that booth to begin with. I'm a card collector. When I go onto a stand that <laughs> yeah. seems interesting, I'll pick up the card and then go home and check the website to see what else they've got. Uh, not just the artists that were represented on the yeah. walls of the fair, but also, as you say, others I mean, that might have slipped by. Yeah. Galleries, sure. online, I mean, it's, it's sure. everywhere. You have to just sort of look and look and look yeah. and try to, try to focus on things that you actually like. Like, yeah. Tim, I, I wonder, um, you know, certainly you go to fairs like everyone else, but also you've got a very interesting angle. Uh, Tim comes from a world of these marvelous um, benefit exhibitions and sales, primarily in the western part of the United States. Could you talk a bit about that world and how it differs or resembles what we're discussing here? Yeah, I, I, uh, as a collector, I really cut my teeth on those types of events. I'm from the west originally, Colorado, Wyoming, and uh, years ago, uh, gosh, you know, the first show I went to was at the National Museum of Wildlife Art. It wasn't all wildlife art, but it was a, it's a fine museum in Jackson, Wyoming. And uh, we went there in September. They have an annual art festival. It's a they invite artists to participate. Uh, they, it's a fundraiser for the museum, and that's really how I educated myself and began my collection and was able to to have a, a winning draw at some of those. They, what they do, they put art on the wall like this and a box related to that. And if you want to buy that piece, then you like a Chinese auction, if you will. You put your name in the box, and if your name is drawn, you're able to buy that piece for the set price. And so a lot of uh, my, you know, Western roots, so Oklahoma City, um, LA, uh, Denver, they'll have shows like that to benefit museums, and so began to be a regular on that circuit, if you will, sure. and was able to cherry pick some great shows and become aware of, because typically only the better artists are invited to those because they want to keep that level of the quality high. And so you're seeing good work and you're tending to see the choicest pieces from that artist because they know it's going to be seen by thousands perhaps in the course of, many thousands, in the course of the duration of the event. It may be a one night event, but the show will hang for two months. Right. In a museum setting. In a museum setting. It's very, it's very nice. Sure. And uh, sure. that's a, it's a, it, not an art fair, but it's an art show and sale that, you know, and the galleries typically, historically, have originally, uh, less so now probably, we're not as keen on that because it took their best artists, put their best work into a venue that wasn't theirs. You know, 
I'm sympathetic to that, but on the other side of that, it's good for the museum institution, raises funds, and gives the artist tremendous visibility. And also introductions that are made between individual collectors and the artist. Yes. And then the collector can go to the gallery and just buy more. Right. You know, that, because, that, you know, that's, that's the, the one side thing. of that for the galleries sure. because yeah. you see, well, here's only you know, only two pieces by Christopher Blossom. Where can I find more of this guy? Right. And then you're then you're going to Russell Janishian or yep. or Claggett Ray and Vale and you're finding more of Blossom. Sure. And so, so American uh, Masters, which occurs here. Uh, was modeled on this very yeah, I, 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 I stole every good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing was original with me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> good. Yes. And it's a, a first in New York, to a certain extent. Yeah, this really hasn't been here yeah. much here in no. the East. Yeah, yeah. no. That, that was first year in 2008 before the economy drop. Yep. We, we sold $411,000 that first night right here. Fantastic. And uh, still amazing. We've no. never done this good since, but we're well, going back now because the economy has returned quite a bit. Sure. Uh, Megan, you're an art lover, and obviously in your museum job, you're not buying art and helping the museum to acquire in terms of donations. But what about you out in the world? Like, do you go to fairs? Do you go to galleries? And if so, what are your impressions of the wide world of commerce? I, kind of, I, I think of it as kind of I have my, as an art historian, I really put on my historian hat because, well, first of all, I was lucky enough. When I was younger in college, I, I had this fantastic internship at the Peggy Guggenheim Collection during the Biennale year. And that was like my first kind of, I haven't been back since, but <laughs> it was like, that was a wonderful kind of introduction to this. Um, and I, of course, you know, when I was in London, I was able to freeze there, and now in my job, you know, now I'm, I'm kind of frequent to these fairs. But um, my dissertation was really a study of why German art was brought over to America and what purpose it was meant to serve. Why people wanted to buy it, why people wanted to hang it up in certain um, institutions, privately or publicly, and what kind of cultural identities that was meant to impart, and how that was either German or American or German American. So, you know, a lot of, I mean, it was basically a dissertation about why people paid for certain German art to come over, and, and when, and why, and how. And so I'm very interested in what people are going to write about what's being bought mm -hmm. now. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, you know, especially from you know cross-cultural exchange and what kind of that is going to be symptomatic of kind of later on. So whenever I, you know, the wide world of contemporary art, I'm a 19th centuryist, as, as Peter knows. We we did our masters with the court at the court school, so we yes. sort of know each other from that. <laughs> but um, so I kind of tend to think of it. Well, I, I can't wait to hear what historians are going to write about this and what happens mm -hmm. happening around me right now. Um, sure. um, but of course, I, I, I like to go for the social aspect. Of course. Well, and it's always been thus. I think there has always been a social aspect to art collecting and yeah. art looking. Uh, but I think I'd like to talk about thinking of global, and by the mentioned Germany, that we are living in a time of unprecedented money flowing into the art market, as the recent sales in New York have revealed a billion dollar art week. $150 million spent on sculptures and paintings that just, we've never seen the likes of this in the history of the world. There's that, and that is art as an investment asset. And there's also the globalism, coming to your point, the notion of foreign buyers in the market who perhaps were not there 10 years ago, and also foreign artists present in our art world. Uh, they're very welcome, of course. We are a country that is founded on freedom of expression, and this kind of open door, new ideas, energize everyone. But it does rather change the tenor of collecting, because if you are, in my opinion, an artist who does not have a name brand going, you've got a problem. Because so much of what we're reading about in the mainstream media, and even in the specialist periodicals, is branded art. It's sold by a famous name, or the dealer has a famous name, or the collectors who are passionate about this artist have famous names. Um, and that can make it a little tricky for all of us who are not branded ourselves. So how do we deal with that? Um, this is something that I think is very much on my mind, at least, as Fine Art Connoisseur magazine tries to advocate for artists who are not necessarily there yet, and may never be. Uh, any thoughts about that aspect of, and I'll focus on Jack just for a minute here, you're a passionate Brooklynite. I love that about you. Uh, you live in Brooklyn, you like to look at galleries in Brooklyn, a lot of the artists that you collect are Brooklynites. 
Now, we all know that Brooklyn has had its own wave of fabulousness Absolutely. wash over it uh, in the last 10 years, but I still think you'll agree that there is a distinction there, that it is not global only, um, even though the name is famous around the world. What are your thoughts about this element of flux? Um, how do we make sure that artists relatively close to the ground, whether they're selling at a nonprofit art center or a small gallery in Williamsburg, that they're not in any way um, pushed out by um, a kind of uh, snobbishness, uh, that, oh, well, you haven't gone to the right art school or you haven't sold at the right prices. Is that something that we can move around? Wow. <laughs> I so no idea. Idea. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, I just don't know. I mean, it's so outside of the way I think about art. Okay. I don't, I mean, of course I know all about the great options. Yeah. You know, Picasso's going for 150 million, but it's so completely outside the realm of right. <laughs> buying or what I think about art or um, art as investment at right. that level. You know, we're regular people. We buy art for $1,000, right. sure. not 150 million. Right. 3,000 3, is like a lot of money. Yeah. Um, so, and there's a lot of really successful artists in Brooklyn, you know, yes. but are they branded? I don't know. Okay. It's, it's, it's hard for me to answer. But, but can I ask you that, and I'm being a little nosy, in your social circles, do you hear people who are solidly middle class, who can afford $1,000 or $3,000, mm -hmm. are they in any way agitated? Like, oh, I don't think I'll collect art, I think I'll collect golf clubs instead, because this world seems to be too, you know, highfalutin, or too expensive? Is there any kind of uh, fear or, or hesitancy uh, on the part of people who otherwise, in a previous generation, would have been art collectors? That, that's what people do when they've amassed a certain amount of money and they have a lovely home to decorate. Yeah. I don't know. How, how does that sound? Probably. Sound? That's true, because I think the art, art world has become very mystified. You know, okay. It's sort of like so glamorous and so global and right. it's sort of so outside the realm of sort of regular middle class people. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure there's been casualties, but you know, I don't think about it. I just buy beautiful work for prices I can afford and I don't, I don't care that it's not branded. Most of our work is not, right. for sure. Um, most of it probably won't go up in value much. Or maybe it will, I don't know. But I don't buy it for the investment because we're just not buying at that level. Right. Um, so, so, Shelby, any thoughts on this? I was just going to say that with the recent auctions and just this crazy week we've had last week, that's not the real world. I mean, that, those those people are not normal people. It's, it's yeah. you know, one half of 1% of, of, of the population can collect on that level. And I think it really skews the the art world right now is just kind of in, insane in a way in that I think it scares people from getting involved and, and starting to collect because they're, they're looking at the very top, top, top and you know, it's like saying, oh, I want to be a CEO and, and instead of starting in the, in the, in the code group, Kocheck, you know, I mean, some of the greatest CEOs started in Kocheck at a, at a firm. Um, so I think that that's all fun to read about, but that's not really the normal collecting public out there. And I'm glad Peter brought that up this up because most of our artists are representational artists, or figurative artists. Um, we do represent some abstraction, but for the most part, it's more. It is more traditional. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim would probably like some of the artists who we okay. hung out to come in. Um, <laughs> We'll talk after. <laughs> <laughs> Always the salesperson. <laughs> anyway, but a lot of questions I get from, I mean, we, we are representing mid to later career artists. They're already established. Herschel and Adler, rent is very high. We don't really represent, we can't afford to represent emerging artists who are not at all known. But they don't usually have secondary auction records. I get asked all the time, hey, what's, this, what's this artist's auction record? I sold a painting by one of our artists for hundred thousand dollars. I mean, his 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 kind of average is seventy to to ninety in there, and I think his auction record is thirty five thousand dollars. So if somebody comes in and looks, the 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 market often is in in with the galleries and the dealers, and it's in that gallery system, and it's not in the public realm. 
So we have this discussion all the time. We look at auction records, mm -hmm. and, and that's just data. It's one piece of the puzzle. And some artists, they're never, they never are at auction. I mean, that's one person I'm, I'm talking about. Everybody loves the work. Nobody's wanting to sell it. And they're all in museums. They don't come up from, they don't come available. I saw it sell them again in the gallery. So I think what you're seeing out there with the auctions is just don't worry about that. I mean, because so few people can play at that level anyway. Um, don't be scared to get come in. I mean, you can come to our gallery and buy something for $2,000. I have friends who say, I can't come into your gallery. I can't buy anything. I want, you know, it's come on in, come in. You know, it's okay. We'll bite. Um, <laughs> You know, start start small and start where you can, and it will grow into so many other things. And don't worry, just block out. That's all noise. In, in my opinion, so, you know. well, I want to follow up. Yeah. So glad you talked about established artists without auction records. So Tim has got some great, very established American living masters. But indeed, in the grand scheme of things, they are recordless. Absolutely. Yeah. Isn't that yeah. weird? Yeah, it is completely. I mean, like some of the greats, yeah. uh, not big ticket number, you know, price, uh, uh, high prices, but, you know, amazingly solid. You know, artists that sell in the $10,000, dollars dollars $20,000 range. I, I frankly think, you know, chiming in on a subject that's related is that uh, artists typically that are you know, my friends or associates, you don't want to be putting it into an auction because mm -hmm. you you it's gonna it'll be a, a detrimental, a detrimental yeah. record because if it doesn't get mm -hmm. gallery prices then then you're it's dealing good. with that and the gallery people are saying well how come this is yeah. is this sold for ten thousand dollars and you're asking for twenty five for and it just it skews sure. everything but yes. uh, it's, so let's face it the internet has changed everything right that everybody thinks they're an expert. And that's lovely when you're looking for a car. Fantastic. <laughs> you know this car is worth this. But I'm concerned for artists when it comes to auction records of their work. Uh, and this also, by the way, applies to estates for artists who are deceased, recently deceased artists in particular, people who died in the last 20 years. This is a real problem because they may not have hit that point either. So I think we've all got to get with it when it comes to using the data carefully and making sure that everyone around us doesn't over rely on the data and then let it lead us down the wrong road or, or close off a road that we really should be taking. Actually. So um, yeah please just so if the piece merits it, if you're standing in a in a gallery and you see a great piece mm -hmm. and the, the piece speaks for itself, then then pay the price. Yep. And enjoy it, and don't look over your shoulder mm -hmm. to say because you're you're not buying for investment likely. You know, uh, some do at those auctions, mm -hmm. but for us, the, we just want to live with it. We want to love it, mm -hmm. and if it's never worth more than we pay, we don't care. Right. Yeah. Good, bravo. Uh, I'd like to talk about museums. Uh, we're not making it here, but I think all of us are museum goers, so we all can chime in on this. Um, the fact is that museums remain the single most prestigious and neutral setting for the public, whether they're knowledgeable or not knowledgeable, to discover art. Uh, whether it's historical or contemporary, emerging or established artists, uh, no one's trying to sell you anything at the museum. And it is, after all, educational. You can read the labels or not. Uh, that's all up to you. And the museum is obviously making decisions, which are generally very spot on when it comes to quality. Now, MoMA is famous, of course, for presenting Matisse and other masters who are beyond any kind of dispute. Uh, and then new artists, emerging artists. Um, and obviously, they've got a track record of some sort. That's how they came to the attention of the curators there. But um, I, I wonder if Megan has a personal thought. I'm not asking you to speak at the institution. But in terms of uh, how, uh, how can the collector um, go into an exhibition of brand new or very recent art and make sense of that. Uh, that obviously everyone's got a gadget in their pocket and they can Google the name of the artist and find out who the dealer is, right? The museum normally does not foreground that information. It's a private collection or courtesy of Jones and Company or whatever. But, but I'm trying to make sure that we, as collectors, use museums as best we can. Any thoughts on how this works at MoMA or elsewhere? Other museums? I, I think a lot of people, this is just the public more generally, in terms of um, being intimidated by contemporary art and 
thinking that you needed explained to you. I mean, I'm kind of a, a victim of this as well, as more of a, a modernist, but I think that it's kind of a, a misinterpretation that you can't, especially more conceptual, abstract pieces, you, if you're thinking about what you want to hang on your walls and you go into a museum and you're not quite sure what to make of it, I really think the kind of the experience of the encounter and why you like things and why you don't, you should really pay attention to that when you go through any gallery. Now, of course, you walk into Matisse cutouts and you're just awash with the seduction of these colors. And I, I gotta admit, I was a Picasso person until that show, <laughs> pure and simple. Um, and it's not just because I work there, but um, I mean, just the power of that color. But I, I do think that um, as far as being intimidated by contemporary art or modern art that we don't understand, we have to first start asking questions about <clears throat> You know, how do I feel when, this is, when I'm in front of this? What does this remind me of? What do I think? You know, the reaction, the kind of initial reaction, is just as important, in my opinion, you know, as a scholar, as a teacher, too, than anything the catalog says. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that those kinds of instinctual reactions kind of guide you into what maybe you'd like to live and have on your walls. Um, and I'm a I mean, I'm a very, I'm not a collector per se, but I do have little objects and things on my walls that kind of, you know, are important to me kind of memory-wise or kind of uh, sort of come some kind of significance, whether they're, you know, arbitrary or actual kind of latent with, sen with sentimentality. Um, I do think that I get cues from my right. museum visits and, right. you know, my, my little, there was a great piece in the Times, I think, of months ago about like your, the imaginary collection, like your collection, and <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, there's a Voyard at the Met that is hanging over my imaginary couch all the time. <laughs> and so I think that... The <laughs> war Tom Campbell. I mean, I'm a Germanist. I can't even really admit that. But, um, we didn't hear it. No, right? God forbid. But, um, but, but it has kind of... I, I have a good friend who's a practicing artist who, who works with me, and I'm going to eventually for, you know, I'm going to commission her to do something for me, yep. and very privately and very kind of just, you know, friend to friend, but I, because I know that this is what I like, because I've spent a lot of time in museums, and there's a few things on the wall here that I've noticed because of my studies that I'm just kind of, you know, right. it's a great kind of place to really kind of figure out what I like and what I don't like, and you don't need the labels or the catalog to figure that out. Of course. Right Even here. though you should buy the catalogs. Right, <laughs> 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 Uh, credit cards accepted. I want to go back to the fish thing, but I would love to hear from each of you about an experience, especially in the museum, but possibly in a gallery or some other setting, where that turned you on to some kind of art or medium or country uh, that, that you then pursued in terms of collecting or just loving something. Because I think that's always very heartening. I think we collectors like to hear what other collectors have gone through in the way of an encounter. I thought that was lovely, Megan, to talk about something that really electrified you. Tim, I mean, you've looked at so many things in museums, especially in the West, but, but everywhere. Uh, is there anything that kind of triggered some new reaction? Absolutely. Uh, the, uh, the moment for me, I went to, uh, Kathy and I were at the Met for their exhibition, American Stories, I think was the name yes. of the exhibition. Yes. And uh, it was a, a grand uh, exhibition that showed primarily, it, it, it was storytelling. Mm -hmm. It was fine art. It wasn't, it wasn't, and I'm sorry to even say this, it wasn't illustration, uh, it wasn't an illustration show, which I dearly love illustration, mm -hmm. but specifically, and they had the great, so Homer, and you can just go all the way through the, the long list, and it was Sargent, and any number of them, but the theme of that show uh, woke something up inside of me. It, it, it clarified something that I believed in, but I had not defined uh, intellect, in, you know, with uh, any intellectual rational. And um, and it was the, the fact that those images all told a story, and that was meaningful to the artist, and he was communicating, or she was communicating an event or a time and a place, and it made me look differently. At, our own collection and and works that I have acquired since. Right. I just that I really like that. Yep. You know, good. Uh, you know, you can have a scene, and the scene can be very simple, very abstract, very beautiful, and that's that's got validity. It doesn't mean that everything has to have uh, you know a, a boy and his dog running down the lane, but. Um, I just think differently after that, and I want a, a, 
painting that I engage with to tell me mm -hmm. its own story. Sure. And some do that better than others. Yes, they do. That's right. Well, I'm sure the Met would be gratified to hear that story. That's great. That's why they do their shows in the first place. Mm -hmm. Jack, has there been some encounter like that for you? Yeah. Um, the thing that comes to mind when you ask that question was, um, Oh, here I go with Brooklyn again, but um, <laughs> a number of years ago, the Brooklyn Museum had a survey of Jean-Michel Basquiat, and I didn't really oddly know his work that well, or I'd seen one or two pieces, and it was a big show, and I was reduced to tears. I mean, the show hit me so emotionally and profoundly, I'm like, this is just, I connected so right. much with it. It was right. really remarkable, and I really, I really do think it impacted. Yeah. What the way I looked at art, the way I bought art, okay. um, and and the way my collection sort of traverses. Well, I really do. So uh, I'm curious then, stylistically, would you say that you began looking in that kind of direction? Yeah. Yeah. In, in yeah. a way that you had not before. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. And it's sort of, um, you know, it was it's because I mean, what I love about it, the work is that it's abstract, it's figurative, it's graffiti, it's narrative. It, encompasses so many things that I'm interested in, and, as well as just being incredibly beautiful and yeah. um, indicative of his time yeah. and, uh, and all that. So, and there's a Basquiat sketchbook show at the Brooklyn Museum yes, now, uh, which is beautiful. Uh, running, I think, into the summer. Yeah. Shall we, any particular encounters? Uh, I don't think no? I have any particular. I mean, I, I think every time I go to a museum, I, I can look at the same painting each time I go back and get something totally different right. out of it. I mean, right. I, I just try to go with an open mind and try not to try to see something yep. in the picture, yeah. or I try not to like something that someone else has told me is fantastic. Mm -hmm. You know, you try to just go with an open mind, and I get I have I just have different. I don't have this, a, a certain kind of aha moment. Right. Okay. I've had so many of them because I'm always trying to look at everything. <laughs> mini aha uh, moments. Yeah. yeah. Mini aha moments. Now here's here's a kicker. I've been hearing around town that. 25-year-olds may ultimately, when they begin collecting seriously, be okay with a sumptuous JPEG file on a big flat screen, rotating one after another, Mona Lisa, that picture over there, now a picture of their dog, and so, you know, that, that, that may become art enough for them. Now, I'm not being anti-young, I'm not accusing anybody <laughs> of being over-digital or whatever, but it's a very interesting concept that, that, you know, each of you, I'm guessing, has connected with the, not just the vision of the artist, the personality of the artist, the messages that are there in the work, but also with the physicality of the artwork. I, I'm going to guess that the brushstroke or the way light hits it the surface, there's something about that thing. And it could be a photograph. I'm not suggesting it has to be a painting. It could be a sculpture. But, you know, a JPEG, uh, a TIFF file, doesn't offer that depth. It may have the overall effect. Uh, but, of course, it's different because it's smaller or larger than the actual object. Does that, how does that fact strike you? Is there any, I'm not saying we need to go out and convince all young people to buy original art, but is there some truth in this rumor, do you think? That, that what would be the answer you might have if somebody said, oh, I'm not gonna buy this here, I'm just gonna get a photo of it from my phone and live with that. Now, I'm gonna guess that one answer is, well, the artist will benefit from that enjoyment because you're walking away with a free photograph of the artwork. Any other? Ways to deal with this. Let them get to age 50. <laughs> <laughs> At 50, everything changes. Okay, got it. No, I'm not trying to stump you. I'm not trying to freak you out. I just think that this is something we all need to keep our eye on because there is that, if you will, industrial problem. That you know, obviously, uh, that format is not as uh, lucrative to the art industry as the actual sale of a work of art. Um, and then there's also the question of personal engagement. You know, how does that actually play? Let me come back to conditioning, since you're stunned into silence. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that, well, first of all, I find that really frightening. I hope that never happens. Okay. Maybe, you know? yeah. But it, it goes back to the whole idea of what the Benjamin call it, the aura. Okay. Right? All right. About how, um, I mean, I mean, I, have, I, 
I've been resistant to those photo frames of look through family right. photos. I mean, I honestly think that, I mean, we're, we're all out of business and that's gonna um, overtake, but there's nothing, there's nothing, uh, I'm totally biased, but there, there's no, there's no place in the real thing. I really hope that doesn't happen to people mm -hmm. from generation. Peter, I'm gonna have okay. some. Well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's worry making, but I'm not sure it's in any way a done deal. I'm just trying to work against that as best I can. And I think all of us probably yeah. would agree that that's a, a good idea. Yeah. So we all have our way of coping with it. Um, commissioning came up several times, and I want to make sure we address that, because a lot of collectors don't realize that they can love an artist's work, but maybe nothing in the room, nothing in the gallery show, is quite right for their work. So how do they go about getting in touch with the artist to learn more about something custom? Shelly, can you start us off? How, how would you normally feel that? Um, well, usually for our exhibitions, we really try to have a client fall in love with something that already exists <laughs> <laughs> on the wall. And often the client would will love that painting if they look a little bit more closely at it. I think that, um, I, will, I will answer your question. Oh, sure. um, I think when people come in, like some, we, some people just fall in love with the art, and then some people, uh, we jokingly call them the over the, so over the sofa, I need something for over my bed, I need something for over the dining room, the over them, they're the over this. And we love those people too, because they buy the art, and then maybe they'll, they, they buy it for the over the mantle, and then they might buy other work by that artist or the other artist who we show for the rest of their home or the rest of their collection. But I think that it's a slippery slope when you come in and say, none of this appeals to me. I need, you know, this is five feet by three feet. I need something that's five feet by four feet. Um, because then the, often some, some artists are very excited to do commissions and some are terrified. And they'll, they'll do it and sometimes begrudgingly, but then, you know, there's this pressure between, there's an expectation. I don't always recommend it. There's an expectation between the, the collector and the artist yeah. uh, about, you know, how it's going to all turn out in the end. And I think it kind of stresses everybody out. And ultimately, when an artist has finished this painting, at least with the artists who we show, we edit. We work with the artists to really edit the group of paintings that we show. So when you come into our show, we've edited out the ones that aren't A pluses, and that they don't, they won't give us something that's not an A plus. So I feel like they've painted that painting a certain way for a reason, and they're, they're happy with it. And they only put one apple in it for a reason, not two apples, or whatever it is. So I think it's, I think it's, uh, you know, for commissions. But then sometimes commissions work, and I'm doing a big commission of sculpture right now, uh -huh. Elizabeth Turk, oh, sure. marble sculptor. Sure. Um, marble for this, for these collectors, it's hand carved marble, and there really isn't anything that suits what they envision, right. and it's turning out to be so far. A very good experience. Right. So it's through me. I do all the dealing. Sure. I deal with the complaints on either end. I hand hold for the artist. I hand hold for the client. Um, sure. You know, we do a lot of hand holding, but we're happy to do it. Yeah. We ultimately want to make the client happy, yes. but not give them a work of art that the artist wouldn't have otherwise right. have made. Indeed, that's a very good point. And, and the artist is grown up and can say, "No, thank you. I don't want right. to take it." Right. Because sometimes they feel pressure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, to please right. the dealer or right. please. I, I think you also, you, you have to be um, willing to take the risk. Mm -hmm. um, we actually commissioned a, a friend, a really good friend, to do a pretty big piece for <laughs> over our pants. Yeah, no, I'm going to it's okay. Um, and it was kind of nerve-wracking, because I was like, I don't know what I'm going to get. Yeah. You know, it's not going into a gallery and saying that, I want that. Right. Um, you're, I mean, they do a sketch, a little maquette, whatever, but you really don't know what it's going to be. So there's that kind of leap of faith that you, I mean, in this case, we knew the person's work really well. Sure. Um, and we knew it was going to be pretty good, no matter what yeah. he did. But um, really didn't know until he finished. And he brought it over and he unbound it. I was like, oh, wow. that's. Quite a surprise, and it's it can be totally delightful. Also, right. but you have to be willing to take that risk. You may not actually love it. Right. right. Yeah. So, um, Tim, Tim, have you commissioned? I can't recall. Never, never no, you haven't. Oh, that's no, and I, I really uh, shy away from that. Oh, okay. uh, okay. just uh, hmm. it, it makes me nervous. Um, I uh, we don't need to do that because we have too much art to begin with. But there, I 
you know, there have been times when I've thought about it, but I'm just, I just think about the what ifs, like, well, so I would commission from someone that I respect greatly, and, and what if I don't like it? What if I don't, what if I don't want it? And, and, and then the, the social aspect of it, you yeah. uh, know, so I just, I've never gone there. I, I know I could, I, I, I know the right people that I could uh -huh. go there yes, with, and, sure. and, and it would be successful. Yes. But, you know, Probably never will. Mm -hmm. a, a sidebar there, I made a call to a gallery once uh, that uh, a great nocturne piece that I loved, and the piece was already sold. And the gallery owner said to me, Well, I can have him paint another one for you. <laughs> and boy, I just recoiled from that. <laughs> and I was like, no, oh, that just Right. That just sounded, that was the worst thing anybody ever said to me in the gallery. It's like, yeah, give you another one. Yeah, this is a, a, a look-alike. I just, I really did find that offensive, you know, and, and not to say that that's not legitimate for some people, right? That was my reaction. There. Well, that's intriguing, coming back to my earlier stopping point about the JPEGs on yes. the screen, yes. because there's something about the artist's original intention in that first nocturne mm -hmm. that you value. That's who you are and you respect that artistic integrity. A JPEG is endlessly replicable. And you know, obviously it, it may have come from an authentic expression, uh, but there, there's something else there that's lacking. So I think this is something very powerful that we need to keep in mind as collectors as we go through our journey. Megan, you talked about maybe commissioning a friend to do something. So how might you go about that? Have you even given that any formal thought? Um, well, I think, know, I, I, I've had a few friends kind of and we not really make friends for artists. And then they've given me some of their work, and it's been, I just happen to like it. But I guess, I mean, it, she, her, her style has to do a lot with what I like um, in what I study. And um, I do have a wall space that I make. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, and then just, I mean, and she knows my favorite kind of color palette. Right. So, so eventually, and it's also been a way to also support someone you believe in. And yes. This isn't, you know, she, th this is how she, you know, this is not her day job, right. and, but it's her passion, and I kind of like the fact that she's pursuing it on top of, you know, other interests, and I want to kind of, that's kind of, if I were ever to be a proper collector, it would be kind of a personal way to support someone sure. who's creative endeavors I believe in on a very personal relationship level. Sure. Um, I, I, I feel very strangely about walking into a gallery and buying something from someone I don't know. I, I, I think I would like to kind of really know what makes them tick. Mm -hmm. per personally, okay. I, mean, this is, I mean, I'm speaking yeah. from Megan, not from sure. a professional point of view. No, 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 of course, but, absolutely, but, that's um, fun. But, yeah. I, but I do think that, that that would be crucial for me to have right. in, in my home. Yep, okay. I just want to clarify my over the comment. <laughs> did not mean it to be offensive in any way. Uh, what I meant was um, clearly, you know, I don't live in a museum, we don't live in a museum, we don't live in a white fox room. So eventually, all of the artwork goes over something. And on a wall, here's something. I like go to the bathroom, whatever. Um, but what I meant was when people come in and they're looking more for the dimension, the outer dimension of something that fits, and not looking at the artwork. It could be by anybody. So it's got to be colorful, and it can't be more than two feet high. That's, that's kind of what I meant, because ultimately, I mean, my art is above my bed, too. But it's, it's, they, they're coming in with parameters yeah. and not looking at the art itself and what the artist has created. So my I'm trying to get people to look at the art is the precise dimension of the camera. Digitally manipulated and you could Photoshop it. So if it's um, but anyway that, that's what I could say. Well I think the alternative okay. under the bed is definitely not good. <laughs> Nobody wants art for that space. Uh, let me ask, before we open it up to the audience for questions, are, are, is there anything burning in your mind that you would like to put across that I didn't sort of scratch at before? Uh, I, this is not a test, but if there was something that you wanted to make sure we heard, now's your moment. No? OK. Oh, please. Yeah, no. We love it. So my colleague, Ted Holland, who's in the audience, we were, we were discussing this. And we, just with the art fairs and, and all the hype is all about kind of blue chip artists, um, trophy hunting, we call it trophy hunting. You, know, you need a Warhol for your yacht, you need a Warhol for your you know, six mistresses <laughs> in each of their you know, apartments all over the world, whatever it is. Um, 
But our most of our program, as I mentioned, is representational uh, art and figurative art. And we've had discussions about what's the difference between representational painting, like what you see around here, and abstract painting. And often, you know, the representational painting we feel is kind of like the stepchild or little sister in, in today's sort of forgotten genre in a way, or not as cool, or not as you know, sexy to collect. Um, but there really isn't much difference between representational painting and abstract painting. It's every, all painting is an abstraction. Mm -hmm. All painting is really figurative. And we, we want there to be more crossover. Mm -hmm. you, you can collect in sure. all different categories. Just because you collect landscapes doesn't mean you can't collect um, abstract or, or, or ceramics or something. There's a lot, and we, we're seeing today that a lot of collectors are Look, you know, try to look at everything. Don't, don't pigeon your whole, the, pigeonhole yourself into one uh, spot. Um, well where, said. Yeah, well, yeah said. I mean, well it's said. just good. Just look at good art. You know, good yeah. painting. Great painting is great painting, whether it's abstract or yeah. representational. I think we don't need to have this divide. You right. know, I collect right. representational art. Well, I collect abstract art. Yes. It's just, I right. collect great art. Totally. Or I collect American art. I collect art by women artists. Um, so I just wanted Thank to you. something Absolutely. that we. We so discuss different. all the time. Well, and I think that we live in a society that is ever specializing. That you know, we want our surgeon to be the very finest in that particular kind of cutting, right? You know, whatever the body part, whatever the problem, we want, and that's great. I mean, in the world of surgery, I'm all for that. But do we need to do that in art, or can we be more open to other things that catch us off guard, that surprise us, that actually work well together? I mean, you know, we're not curating a museum exhibition at home, but we might want to imagine that we are. That's actually a nice thing to do. Um, to, absolutely. I mean, I think Jack's collection in particular. Yeah, shines some light for me, working with decorators, the analogy is the best decorators can do it all. Yep. They can do Rococo yep. and Bauhaus together totally. in a room, and it's fantastic. And that's kind of, for me, the analogy of what you're talking about, yes. Shelley. And, but you've got to have a great eye. Yep. You can't just mix it all together and hope for the best. You have like a really strong point of view and a good eye, and you can mix them, and it's fantastic. And we're all trying to train our eyes, basically. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we want to look at examples, role models that are terrific. Uh, and, and in general, it's nice to think that museums and magazines uh, put in front of us those great uh, case studies that we can learn from, definitely. So the audience, please, we don't want you to feel locked out. Yes, sir. I have a dilemma, and I can't believe that I'm alone in the dilemma, that a third, let's say, of what we have on our walls, we inherited. A third of your collection is inherited? Okay, wow. Uh, and long since, this is a long time ago, we've lived in many years, our children have expressed their frank indifference to the... <laughs> <laughs> what's the best, what's the best strategy for someone in that situation? We would like to, we've downsized, there are large pictures we want, there are a lot of things we, we'd like to do, but what, what, what's the best thing to do? You're talking to the right panel. The, the question was, uh, we've got this collection that we'd like to uh, move along, uh, what to do? And, and some of the work is historical, presumably. Uh, much of it anyway. Uh, so thoughts on, on the, the most easy and effective and hopefully profitable and, and public spirited way to do this? Anybody? Well, it's something that we all face, you know, as, yep. as, as I age, as we age. I mean, my wife's not 89, but not <laughs> understood. Not yet. <laughs> but, you know, as that time goes by, then you begin to think. And, and so now I see in the auction catalogs from the estate of, and this is this. I've been to two sales or observed two sales this year that were prominently, you know, some great pieces and yeah. and the kids weren't interested. You know, it just didn't, you know, they, you know, uh, John Stern spoke with one uh, uh, talk and he said the children look at the art on your wall as the ATM on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 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 you know, I... I don't know. I, I'm with you there because I don't know. You know, we we think of you know, donations to museums or sure. donations to the Stanley Gundy Club. Uh, we, we we discuss that here. Some things we don't want. Some things we can't properly you know exhibit. And when you give to a museum, you can't necessarily know that that's going to be shown, or you can't necessarily know that it's not going to be sold. That's going to be a term of the uh, recipient. You know, or, uh, you know, to you the, uh, from them and. Uh, 
So, uh, Peter, we look to you for the answers. Well, <laughs> I, I want other panelists to chime in before I say something. But, uh, shall we? Uh, I was just going to say there's so many routes you can go, and I mean, just us up here, we can, <clears throat> we would be able to help you with that. I mean, there's you could take some of the work to a dealer, and we take things on consignment. And usually, if I took a painting from you, I would charge 15 to 20 percent of the selling price so it's in our best interest to try to get the best price for that work of art I mean you probably don't want to drop it all in one auction you know because if nobody goes to that sale it won't do very well you have the bad auction records for the for the artist um, you know you could have a plan where maybe some of the work goes to a gallery maybe some of the work goes gets donated to the college you went to you can call the curator and say where, where are the gaps in your collection you might have xyz would you like something then you could you know speak with megan and say what are you missing you know, if you have things for a moment for example you know what's what's your wish list would you be interested in any of my work because then it's kind of scattered out there and, and doing good in some instances and also um, making money in other instances. So I think there's a lot of consultants you can talk to. I mean, you, you, I can talk to you more about it after. And I mean, there's so many galleries. We take, we, we work with the states all the time. And if something isn't for us, we don't think we can work with that type of material. We'll say, we'll go to XYZ Gallery. I'll make a call for you. We were really trying to help people with that. Because we don't want art to sort of dumped. Yeah. Somewhere because it's not going to benefit anybody, and there's no you don't have to do it all in one fell swoop. Yeah. I just had a question for you. Are you are you trying to sell individual pieces or, no. or is it a whole collection? No, no, it's not. It, oh, it's all individual. These are individual pieces that are distinctive, and, and therefore there's no particular thread. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's something that we all <laughs> probably face in one way or another. Yeah, sure. Um, one thing that we didn't touch upon, and, and maybe we could here, in fact, is the question of art advisors. Uh, that there are, as you know, uh, people who are full-time art advisors. Um, they live among us. Um, and basically, their job is to help the individual collector in some way. It could be deaccessioning material. It could be buying material. Um, or even uh, cataloging it, you know, sort of making sure that it's better cared for with its climate control and security and all of that. Have any of you had any particular thoughts on that emerging field? The field of art advising is growing naturally because the prices are growing on the auction market. There are more and more people who see this as a very profitable living. Uh, and they're quite right. Uh, I've met some very good ones and I've met some very dumb ones. Uh, but I think that's true in every field, you know. Um, has anybody, any, any particular? <laughs> we'll talk over drinks. <laughs> the bar is open downstairs. <laughs> that's so, such a good question. I, I, yeah. I don't want to. Uh, Jack, have you actually had occasion to uh, work with an advisor? Uh, or o only if I'm designing space right. for a corporation yes, sure. to actually have an art budget. You're an architect, so that makes sense. Yeah. Then sure. we'll bring in an art advisor. Okay. But personally, no. Right. Okay. I'm just not buying at that level. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Expense. There's not enough that's margin. Just, yeah. And I feel confident enough in our own point of view and sure. education that I, I don't feel any difference. I'm personal. Right. Okay. So. Tim, you haven't done that either, have you? No. No, I want to call attention to the fact that the the advisor helping to disperse a collection has a very different role to play. Very uh, much like what Shelley was describing, in the sense that this is about getting the best deals and making the most good effect with the work. Um, there's not much involved in the taste department, because that's really not the issue. You already have the work. You're not looking for new work. So I think we can talk after if you'd like. I think I have some ideas, too. Any other questions from the floor um, about collecting? Yes. I, I have a question for the whole panel. I'm a professional painter for 15 years, and I'm also a modest collector. But I, I'm curious to hear about the panel's uh, opinion about uh, the hybrid, uh, which uh, sort of emerges when a, um, an auction house establishes uh, itself as a gallery as well. I don't know how common this is, but uh, where I'm from, Stockholm, Sweden, that, that happened at uh, one point, and there was an outcry by the galleries. And it was sort of a confusion amongst collectors and so on. And I've yeah. any thoughts on this? The, the question has to do with what about auction houses that are becoming galleries as well? Yes. Uh, exactly. How is that? I'm just yeah. repeating it for uh, the record. That's all. That, so what those can hear. Um, 
I think Shelley might have opinions on that. Um, <laughs> Steve, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll chime in because I think I'm maybe safer to say this than you. Um, the, the fact is that um, for sure the dealers are not delighted because, of course, there are now a lot of private sales occurring at auction houses where the work is not being shown to the public. Now, it's understood that the auction houses, because they too collect a percentage on the sale, are working very hard to get it into the most expensive hands. So that's all good for the seller. Um, the, the problem is that um, it certainly takes away from the, if you will, artistic and educational impact of an artist's career because we're not seeing the 360 of the artist either at this moment because it's recent work or a retrospective of the whole career. We're only seeing a snippet and chances are it is the very best example. It's, it's cherry picking. I mean probably the auction houses are not going to deal with third rate, you know, off day work. They're going to deal with the very best. Um, that's not always true, but I would imagine that's the case. Now, there's nothing wrong with excellent work, but it does rather throw things off. Um, and also, of course, those private sales are not recorded into the auction records, like if the auction house was selling it in a room like this with a gallery. So there's a kind of opacity to this, which is a problem. Now, we all know that dealers don't record their selling prices either, but at least you can go to that specific gallery and ask, you represent Joe Jones, what are the prices generally? And the dealer, who's smart, is going to kind of give an accurate answer. The auction house has absolutely no obligation to tell you anything about that private sale. So I think this is a very slippery slope. It is completely legal, but it is definitely getting into some gray areas when it comes to how we as collectors learn and behave, and also how artists are going to flourish or not flourish. Um, I'm interested to hear your story that in Sweden it became a controversy. Yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, did you have a question? Uh, nope. Just scratching the head. Okay. Sorry. What were you going to say about that? Yeah. Okay. Go. I was just going to say, I think, because the art, there's so much money being pumped into the art market right now, so many people want a piece of it. And so I think a lot of roles are being, I don't know, melded, merged twisted in a way. I mean, I think in the old days, the dealers would go to an auction. The dealers would go to an auction. The public people, collectors, would, wouldn't go to auction. It's just dealers, they buy the merchandise, they buy it, they take it back to their galleries, they would research it, restore the painting. You know, I'm, I'm talking about the owner of uh, Herschel Nadler, Stuart Fell, who's on the gallery for 45 years, and he was a curator at the Met before going to Herschel Nadler. And, you know, he believed in these early American landscapes, the, the Durans and the Giffords and the churches and the Coles, you know, and nobody did. He did the research. And then you would go to Stewart to buy a painting from Stewart because he's the ex was one of the experts in that field at that moment. So I think now we, I kind of cringe because we have certain areas of expertise at the galleries and you might go there to talk to a dealer who that's their, that's their thing. And the auction houses now, I mean, I have a lot of my best friends work in auction houses mm -hmm. and it's this sort of feudalistic, it's this, you know, tenuous ecosystem, I think, between museums and galleries and auctions and, you know, commercial versus non-commercial. And I think um, the auctions right now are trying to be everything. They're trying to be dealers, they're trying to be consultants, they're trying to be, uh, brokers, they're trying to be banks, uh, they're trying to be investment um, lawyers, they're trying to be investment uh, consultants. So I think, you know, but they may not, at the, end of the, at the end of the day, they want to sell that painting and it's out. You can't go back to them and talk to me about the picture. And they, um, So I think the galleries are kind of in a, because I mean, if, if Peter wants to bid, bid on a painting, and I'm at the gallery and I want to bid on the painting, He's the client who I would sell it to. So I'm out, I'm out. I can't bid on it because if I buy it, I can't then mark it up 15% to cover my cost of having it in my show to sell to me. So it's really hard. I mean, we, we, we don't buy as much at auction anymore. Um, 
It's no accident that Southern yeah. Christie's now call themselves art businesses. Art businesses. They don't yeah. call themselves auction houses. And there are specialists at the auction houses who are, who are brilliant. Oh, they're, they're amazing. They're really brilliant. Some I'm just saying that the field. they're really yeah. now dealers, not yeah. really auctioneers. Sure. Just so much. And, and if I could add that. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting. It's such an interesting. Just last month, yeah. Alfred Tubman died, and this yeah. is one of the people who put this into motion. I'm not accusing him of anything, but he developed retail shopping malls, and he bought some of these in the 1980s, totally legal. Uh, maybe he bought it in the late 70s, I can't remember, but it doesn't matter. He then began to steer some of these into his retail-oriented, serve the client directly mindset, and that's where we've gone uh, as a world. I mean, I'm, it's all part of our societal evolution, uh, this element of anyone can participate. Uh, you call it democracy, fine, or you call it a kind of uh, squandering of expertise. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that really, there's a very valid debate to be had. I think the transparency is fantastic. On the other hand, we do lose some of that ambiance that the galleries and other uh, venues have been able to provide. The implement that you put behind the painting, like the dealers usually believe in the picture that they're selling. Like if they want to stay in business, yeah. you know, you, you want right. you to come back as a repeat. Indeed. Yeah. Collector. Um, yeah. With the auction house, it's a one-off. That's it. It's the cherry, and the cherry's gone. And yeah. Now, and there, I mean, there away. are experts everywhere. I'm just going to say that just each each business has its own agenda. I mean, art advisors. If you're walking around with an art advisor, if they have an agenda. They may. You should ask them what kind of. How are they earning their commission? Are they earning a commission from you? Or are you paying them as a Fee? Are you paying them on the uh, end result of your shopping for the month? You know, because sometimes advisors will get a percentage from the client, and then they come to the gallery and they say, "Well, I want my percentage." So they're getting it kind of both sides, and you know, ultimately, the artist isn't getting as much. I mean, it's just it's you know, everybody's trying to make some some money, but ask what the what their kind of ultimate goal is in helping you. But I, I, I do want to underscore the word ecosystem, though. I think that's absolutely right. And that is one of the great joys, in fact. I think that it is efficient. Uh, but it's also, in terms of collecting, what a joy to come into a world of kindred spirits. That some may be more money-minded than others, but the fact is I think all of us have really enjoyed our careers in this field, whether we've done it out of personal interest or professionally in our day jobs, uh, that there is this sense of community and looking at art together. Uh, and I hope that all of you will do that. In one way or another, you're making it, or you're buying it, or you're talking about it. It's all good, because this is something that enriches every one of us. Thank you for coming tonight.